How is everyone today? Amen. So two or three clap. How is everyone today? There you go. Amen. I, I am really excited. You're probably wondering why I'm so excited. And it's because of a series of teachings that I know the Holy Spirit has put upon my heart to share with each and every one of you. And not just you, but even those that are not here today and those that will continue to come and fill these pews. It's not just a sermon today, but a number of teachings that God has given me from the book of Nehemiah. When we think of the Word of God, often many books of the Bible get overlooked. Yeah. Nehemiah is one of them. Yeah. But this isn't just your boring, run-of-the-mill, inductive Bible study on what Nehemiah happens to say and what you've been missing. I really believe that what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a prophetic word for God's body today. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we seek Him before we begin. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, that all we need is your instruction in our life. All we need is your grace and your power. All we need is you. And we're hungry for you today. We're hungry for an infilling of your Holy Spirit today. We're hungry, Lord God, to know you and to know your word more. And to not just have head knowledge, but to walk in your ways. So, Father God, I pray that you would fill up your body here at Beit Hallel today. You would fill us up. Even those, Lord God, that watch online, fill them up. Father God, I pray that you would teach us according to your word today. And that you alone would be glorified in center stage. Adonai Sintai, Ufi, Yiki, Tehilateka, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth, help me tell forth your praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen and Amen. As I approach this teaching series, and like I said, this is going to be at least, because some of these topics are so heavy, I might go into two weeks on a certain topic, a certain context of what we're looking at in the book of Nehemiah. So this should go only, only 12 weeks, but I'm thinking it may go longer. Also, to the second weekend of December, Rabbi Dan Jester and Patty's going to be here from Israel. So mark your calendars to be here that day. And I know that what he's going to share is going to augment what the Holy Spirit is doing here. And he's coming to speak life and instruction to us as our shaliach, as our leader from the land. But all other weeks... I'm going to be teaching on this. I even prayed about it last night. I said, Lord, Hanukkah's coming up. I normally do a special set-aside Hanukkah message. The Lord says, no, you're going to do Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Because there's truth in there even for our understanding of Hanukkah and God's deliverance. Amen. But the key is to be obedient to God and what he's saying in the moment. And I really feel that this is a living word that God has for us. And um, I'm glad that we're recording this because I want others who are not here today and others that are interested can go and study and learn and receive an impartation of what the Holy Spirit has for them. I really believe, beloved, that we are in a new season Amen. as a congregation. Yes. A new time. A time for renewal, a time for instruction, and a time for the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. It's as if the Lord is wiping the slate clean and saying, we're starting fresh with something new that I have for you. Are you ready for it? Amen. Are you ready for it? Yes. As I said, the series will center on the book of Nehemiah. But it's also going to be dealing, this is why I was urging everybody, we have the books here. Don't leave without one today. Okay? And uh, $10, but it's very important you have this because it parallels with what I'm going to be teaching over the next number of weeks. The 12 Pillars of Tikkun, our book. The 12 Pillars of Foundation for Congregations, Ministers, and Fivefold Associations by Dan Juster. Be sure to get a copy of this. Everybody has 10 bucks. They can afford this. 
and it's central to, to what we're going to be looking at. And I really encourage each and every one of you to get a copy. And, uh, and you know, what if we sell out? We'll get more. Okay? It's a good thing to be part of the Jacoon family. They'll just keep on providing this stuff for us so that we're fully equipped in the Word of God. But I believe that there is a new concentration, a new vision of what the Holy Spirit is showing us. Literally, a shift in the atmosphere and the direction that we're going. But first, we have to look at the context of our book. Now, normally when I start that, I've taught this series once before, many years ago. And you start off talking about the kingdom of God. We're going to do that next week. And I'll be mentioning that again later. But we need to set a firm foundation. We need to understand what God is saying from his word. Namely, the book of Nehemiah. And there is so much we can glean. And we're not even going to get past the first chapter today. And I want you to have notepad ready if you have that. Or bookmarks or however. The aids that help you study and learn. Because this is vital and important. So what do we see first here when we're entering into the book of Nehemiah? Well, first, we have to understand and see the context of what we're going to be teaching and the direction that we're going to be going. The title of not only this message, but this series is Nehemiah and the Restoring of Our Age-Old Foundations. I want you to write that down because we're going to be following that for weeks. Nehemiah and the Restoring of Our Age-Old Foundations foundations. Nehemiah was serving God in the diaspora, a man of prominence, anointing, and calling by God, a man that was distant from the land of Israel, and his heart was broken over it. And what does he hear in the very opening verses of the book of Nehemiah? The walls of Jerusalem have been torn down, they've been broken down. And the people, the Jews who have returned to the land, are in distress. And he grieves. He grieves. When I look at this, God reminded me of our calling too. God is calling us, Beit Halal. God is calling us, Messianic believers, to build up, to restore, and erect again and anew what the ancient paths that have been lost. The holy calling of God. The lifting up of His Torah. His commandments and His purposes for our lives. I believe that this is a prophetic and a timely message for us. We live in a season where yes means no and no means yes. And good has become evil and evil has become good. The world has literally gone crazy right before our very eyes. And it's only getting worse. Just this last week, when we thought the horrors could not get any worse, there was a play in Baltimore, blocks from the place I used to live only a few years ago. And they were doing Fiddler on the Roof. And an intermission some crazy fool stood up and started screaming, Zig Heil, Heil Hitler, Heil Trump. And the people panicked and stampeded out of the auditorium. We live in a world where the BDS movement is rampant. This woman's march that they're planning is really just a masquerade for overt, direct anti-Semitism against God's people. And when we stand for holiness, when we stand for righteousness, when we stand for truth as the body of Messiah, we are vilified, aren't we? Yeah. We're treated like we're stupid Neanderthals yeah. that the world would be better off without. And is it not true? It's getting worse. And it's getting worse. Truly, the walls have been torn down, my friends. We live in precarious times like no other time in human history. And in this, God is calling us to rise up to the call that he has for us. As I think of this, I'm reminded of a leadership conference with Takun that Rebetzin and I were at 
back in 2012 in Baltimore, outside of Baltimore, is where they always have the conference. And at the leaders' conference, conference Rabbi Ekan, Ekan Shishkov, dear friend of ours from Tents of Mercy in Israel, challenged the leaders there, and I believe that it's a challenge for us today. The Lord brought this back to my memory because it's timely. He challenged the leaders there to be as Gideon, to be warriors for the Lord, to be willing to stand in the face of direct opposition and hate for the good news. And he says, in the last days, God is calling forth an army, if you would be part of that army. But not just an army, he's calling for holy revolutionaries, Aton said, who through obedience, would fan the flames of revolution and revival. Now, in our liberal culture that we live in, that we were just speaking of, in an ever-increasing age of godlessness and socialism, rhetoric and words such as revolutionary and revolution carry a very ugly, evil, almost, if not literally, communist so, if you Google the word revolutionary, I did it this morning, you know what comes up? And you hit photo, Cuba. Cuba. So certainly revolutionary is that a word that can be redeemed? And I say, yes, it can be. And not only can it be redeemed, we need to take it back. Amen. We need to take it back. For us in Yeshua, God provides a greater, a greater definition of what it is and what it's meant to be. As I was studying this morning, I looked and I saw what revolutionary meant. It said this in the dictionary, the involving or causing of complete and dramatic change, ergo, a rebellion from what is conventionally accepted. But I think for us as Messianic believers, the definition is all too much different than that. It's far, far from that. For us, to be a holy revolutionary is a rebellion against Satan, his lies, and the things of this world. Where in the name of Yeshua and by the power of the Ruach, the power of the Holy Spirit, we choose today to wholeheartedly embrace complete and dramatic change for the Lord and transformation in his life, in, in his name for our own lives and for the whole world. Amen. To be a holy revolutionary, to be one that is set apart, counting the cost and running to the battle. Amen. Now, when we look at our text today, back in Nehemiah, it's interesting that the Jewish holiday that we're soon upon is Hanukkah. I really believe that God is looking for and calling forth and calling out to you and say, will you be a Maccabee for me? Yeah, Judah Maccabee was a young man and an ark, but all of us are called to step up, to step up and to take our place in God's holy battle with hearts of compassion for his will and a willingness, a willingness to do what he calls us to do. And what is he calling us to do, beloved? To restore the age-old foundations. And in doing that, we must embrace God's purposes at this time. For such a time as this. For a revolution of holiness and life and light and restoration. Not by tearing down and rebuilding something new. You know, we see that with replacement theology. It never worked. But instead, through reestablishing and reaffirming our original call in the Messianic context. But first, we have to look at the context, I believe, of the scroll of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. Now, we know that Scripture interprets Scripture. You can't just pick a verse and just randomly read it. You're not going to get what God's telling you. Now, he might have a living word for you in the moment, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about understanding the Bible in its proper context. Amen. 
Now, as you know, and it's coming up, the months are creeping up, and it's going to be January soon. I'm going to be going back to GLC for another set of shows, and it's Nehemiah that I'm going to be teaching. And the Lord told me that. And as I started researching this, I was reminded of a fact that I had forgotten, that we should never forget. First, the context. The historical context of the book of Nehemiah. To understand this, we have to first look at the book of Esther. Babylon conquered Israel in three stages. In 605, 587, and 539 BCE, leading God's people into captivity. Persia then conquered Babylon, and Cyrus later issued a decree allowing Jews to return to the land. However, the story of Esther surrounds those Jews who remained in the diaspora. Center stage with that is Esther and Mordecai, who remained in captivity but brought deliverance to God's people. Historically, immediately after that, literally in the same time period, the book of Nehemiah was written, listed like, listed like the books of Ezra and Esther, Ezra, Ezra, Esther and Ezra, was written during the same time of captivity as chronicled in the book of Chronicles in 605 BCE. Literally, in Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, what do we see? Zerubbabel, or Zerubbabel, led a group of Jews, what? Back to the land. And for what purpose during 445 and 444 BCE? To worship the Lord. Where there were shouts of praise and worship and repentance, the Torah of God was brought back in and revival spread throughout the land. So people think, oh, revival didn't start till Acts chapter 2. That couldn't be farther from the truth. God's heart of revival has always been there since the beginning of creation because he desires to impact us with his power and his love. And finally, this brings us to our text, the book of Nehemiah. And where does this happen? It opens 12 years literally after this great revival that we see in Ezra chapter 9 and chapter 10. Written during the post-exilic, post-exile community, chronicling the completion of God's holy temple, the place of God's praise. See, this hits very close to home for us here at Beit Hillel, because when God gave us a name for a congregation, it was through the spirit of prophecy. You will be called Beit Halal, a house of praise. But what was the original house of praise? It was the tabernacle. It was the temple. It was the place where Hashem's glory resided. A pillar of fire at night, a cloud by day. His burning presence. Remember this, the prophetic word that we receive today. And this brings us to the opening report that we see in Nehemiah chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, your study Bibles, it's page 1280. And we see in verse 3, and I'm going to begin by reading verse 1 to 3. The word of Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, the son of Halchilah. And it was in the month of Kislev, on the 24th of the 12th year, as I was in Shushan. Shushan, remember Esther? Yes. The capital the Hanani, one of the kinsmen, came out of Yehuda with some men, and I asked them about the remnant of Judeans who had escaped the exile and about Jerusalem, about Jerusalem. And they answered me, the remnant of the exile left there in the providence are in great distress and are held in contempt. And the walls of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem is in ruins and its gates have been completely burnt up. Now, hearing bad news, all of us can answer certain ways, can't we? We can answer in anger, we can answer in fear, or we could do what Nehemiah did. We can cry out to God, and this was his response, verse 4 through 6. On hearing this, I, Nehemiah, sat down and wept, I mourned for several days, fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, please, Adonai, God of heaven, 
You great and fearsome God who keeps his covenants and extends grace to those who love him and observe his mitzvot, his commandments. Let your ears now be attentive and your eyes be open so that you will listen to the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you these days, day and night, for the people of Israel, your servants. See, this matches perfectly, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 137. Psalm 137, if you could. It deals exactly with what we're reading here. Even these very words might have been running through the prophet's mind, where he said, Im ishtak Yerushalayim tishkak yamini. By the rivers of Babel, we sat down and wept as we remembered Zion. We had hung up our lyres, our musical instruments, and the willows that were there when those who had taken us captive asked us to sing them a song, mockery, or tormentors demanding joy from us. Sing us one of the songs from Zion. How can we sing this song about Adonai here on a foreign soil, here in a foreign land? If I forget you, Yerushalayim, may my right hand wither away. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I fail to remember you, if I fail to count Yerushalayim, the greatest of all my joys. He was broken. Nehemiah was broken. He was already broken because he was in the diaspora, longing for Jerusalem. Longing to return to the holy city. Longing to return to the temple. For those of you, like myself, that have been to Israel, you know what that feels like. It's almost like a death to get back on that plane and come home. Because a part of you stays there. Now can you imagine if the temple, the Mishkan, the very center of all worship has been destroyed? torn down, burnt up, and the people of God persecuted in that place, and you can't do a thing about it. You would be in torment. And here he was in torment. And he answered. Like Mordecai, what did he do? He first cried out to God for help. And then as Queen Esther, what did he do? He sought the Lord. And then he sought for help. He appeared to the king, and he said, save my people. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. In the month of Nisan, on the 20th year of the king's reign, it happened that I took the wine and brought it to the king. Prior to then, I had never appeared sad in his presence. And the king asked, why do you look so sad? You're not sick, so this must be deep inner grief, the king said. At this, I became very fearful, as I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why shouldn't I look sad when the city, the place where my ancestors' tombs are, lies in ruins and its gates are completely burnt up? And the king asked me, what is it that you want? And I prayed to God in heaven. Have you ever been in that situation? You need an immediate answer from the Lord. You pray. And he prayed to the God of heaven. And then he said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has won your favor, send me to Yehuda, send me back to Jerusalem, to the city of my ancestors' tombs, so that I can rebuild it. With the king, with the queen sitting there next to him, the king asked me, how long is your trip going to take? When will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a time. Now, I want you to notice here as we're looking at this, and I'm trying not to go too long, but this passage that we're looking at and this message I have for you today is so vital, I believe. We need to understand the sequence. The prophet Isaiah, or the prophet Nehemiah, excuse me, receives the negative report. The walls have been torn down. And his response, as I said, was not in the flesh. It's not in the natural. It's in the supernatural. He cries out to God in intercession and prayer. But what's important here is the time frame. It's easy to miss it if you just skim through the passage. He receives the report when? During the month of Keslev. Guess what? 
We're in the beginning of the month of Kessler. Right before Hanukkah. And he sits on it and he prays and he seeks the Lord until when? The month of Nisan, Passover. And then and only then he goes to the king. Then and only then he appeals to the king with a broken heart. He could have gone to him a day right after he found out. But no, he waited five months upon the Lord, seeking the Lord. Remember it said he prayed day and night, day and night, crying out to the Father. See, he needed that time of preparation. He needed that time of anointing to be set apart for kingdom work. He couldn't do it before. It was God's perfect time. And then what happens? It happens during the month of Keslev. God promises that I will rescue my people from their oppression. And then what happens in the sign Passover? We are rescued from our oppression. Do you see the connection here? It's just under the surface. We could easily miss it, but we shouldn't. We shouldn't miss it at all because it speaks not just of God's timing, but his salvation in the moment. See, this is God's timely message for us, Faith Hillel, today, that we have been prophetically called today here to bring restoration to our city of Ocala. Amen. God is saying here, the month of Kesselev, I'm starting you in this process. But hold on, because come Nisan, I'm going to be pouring out my power. Will you cry and wail and plead to me for this city? Will you receive my broken heart for the city of Ocala? Or will you just play synagogue and move from one Saturday to the next? God's calling us to so much more. And like with Nehemiah, we are promised a victory. We are promised a harvest field. A harvest field. God does not call us to do religion. He calls us to walk in holy fire and anointing. But we're afraid, aren't we? Why? Because if I step out, what if nothing happens? Well, you know what? It's not up to you. It's up to him. Amen. It's up to him and his fire within you. Yes. See, this perfectly parallels with all our call to intercession and the work of ministry that God has for us. God is calling each and every one of you and even those that are not here today and those that are to come to be his holy, set apart, revolutionaries. Yes. Who will take the word of God and the power of the spirit and go in the power and the might of Adonai and see lives restored, bodies healed, demons cast out, and those that are spiritually dead set free. Amen. We must be like Nehemiah, knowing that the weapons of our warfare are not physical, they are spiritual. And we need to be filled up with power for this great work. God is calling us to prophetic intercession. If you were with us Wednesday night at Jose and Alina's house, as we prayed and sought the Lord, the Lord brought a renewal of vision and understanding to us of what real intercession is supposed to be like. It's what many in the body of Messiah today call harp and bowl. If you don't know what that is, I want you to write it down because it's going to become a part of your spiritual DNA. Harp and bowl. And we're going to be looking at this. Because the question is, I know what you're saying, Rabbi, but how do I get there? How do we get there? How do I walk in that kind of power? And we're going to see that today. As revolutionary, revolutionaries in Yeshua, the age-old foundation that God wants to birth afresh and anew in us is through worship. It's through prayer. It's through the power of the prophetic and the moving of God's spirit for the last days. As a man after God's own heart, Nehemiah knew the Father's heart, and he came to know it deeply. It was over those five months he cried out to the Lord, Restore your holy temple, Lord. Restore your holy temple. I'm sure there were nights he said, Hineni, here am I, Lord, send me. And what did God do? He sent him. We're reminded of the words of verse 4 of chapter 1. On hearing this, he sat down, he wept, and he mourned for several days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. 
God called Nehemiah to action and by the power of the Holy Spirit sent him back to Jerusalem, the Beit Hillel, the house of praise. God is calling us as Beit Hillel to be not just a house of praise, but a house of prayer, intercession, fasting, weeping, seeking the Father's heart, and receiving the impartation of God's Spirit for the last days. Yes. So where does this heart and bowl come in? What does it mean, you might ask? Well, write down, you can look at it later. First, First Chronicles chapter 15 and 16. Powerful text. What do we see in 1 Chronicles 15 and 16? We see the Ark of the Covenant, the Torah of Adonai, the truth of God's Word, coming back to Jerusalem. Coming back, the house of praise into the temple of God. And what do we see? We see not only King David, Magan David, dancing and praising the Lord and all the priests, but we also see his wife, Michael, mocking him. She's judged for that. But the reality is it starts and begins with redemption, power, and healing for the nations. Chapter 15 of Chronicles, verses 25 through 28. So David, the leader of Israel, and the commanders over thousands, went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai out from the house of Oved Edom with Simcha, with joy, since God was helping the Leviim, the Levites, who were carrying the ark for the covenant of Adonai, say, sacrifice seven young bulls and seven rams, and David and all the Levites, all the Leviim, bearing the ark, the singers, and Kanayah, the music leaders, catch this, the music leaders, for the singers were all wearing linen cloaks, and David also wearing a linen ritual vest. So all Israel brought the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai and shouting, blowing on the shofars and trumpets and cymbals, sounding with lutes and with lyres. We see the imagery here. Prayer. Prayer and worship mixed together. What does it do? It moves the heart of God. It's not just, oh, we sit and we quietly pray. We don't put God in a little box. Guess what? If your God just exists in a little box, you're never going to see his power. That's right. You're never going to see his anointing. You're never going to see his healing and restoration in your life. But when you let him be God and he breaks that box, destroys it completely, yes. and shows forth his glory, Amen. then we will see signs and wonders in the outpouring of God's spirit. See, in the end, our messianic calling is not just... <laughs> A nice little calling. It's prophetic and it's for the sake of restoration. This continues in the Brit Hadashah in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 15, verses 13 to 18. Now, looking back, we saw in Chronicles, what did we see? The house of David, the praise of Adonai, and the house of David, David's temple. In verse, 15, or verse 13 through 18 of chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles, Yaakov said, Brothers, here is what I have to say. Shimon has told in detail what God did when he first began to show his concern for taking from among the Gentiles a people to hear or to bear his name. And the words of the prophets are in complete harmony with this, for it is written, get this, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the fallen tent of David. I will rebuild its ruins, restoring the age-old foundations. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it, says the Lord, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. That is all the nations who have been called by my name, says Adonai, who is doing these things. There was a prophecy. There was the foreshadow. That was in the Tanakh. And now we have the fulfillment in the Messianic community. Starting in Acts chapter 15. And what's the context of Acts chapter 15? It's a Jew and Gentile wanting Messiah. It's, you don't have to be a Jew to be saved. God loves everyone. And now in power and in might and my spirit, I send you forth as one people. And how is it done? 
by restoring the house of praise in David. This is not a new message. I remember back in the 1980s, I studied and was part of the Vineyard Christian Movement under John Wimber. And there was a prophetic word that was given to John Wimber, and it's still true today. And God said to John, I am restoring to you in the vineyard the harp of David. And how many vineyard songs after that became the common vernacular of all worship music around the world, which set off everything all the way up to Bethel and to IHOP and everything that's going on. Wouldn't have happened if it hadn't have been for what God did with the vineyard back in the 80s. And much of what we experience in the Messianic movement, especially those of us who walk in fivefold ministry, is bearing in the fruit of what God started then. But it didn't start with John Wimber. It started back in Acts 15, when God says, I'm restoring to you the house of praise. I'm restoring to you the house of worship. I'm restoring to you my holy temple. And we can look and we say, where's the temple? It's torn down. But it's a temple in your heart. It's a temple of worship and praise. It's a temple of lifting up the name of Yeshua. It's a temple of being God's people committed to prayer and fasting and revival and seeing the outpouring of God's spirit upon this earth. We can play religion or we can experience God in all of his glory. The choice is ours, but I'm telling you for me, the choice has been made. And then the harp and the bowl we see not just in the book of Acts and in Chronicles, but we see it in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And this is the most vivid and most powerful of all the texts. Revelation 5, 6 through 8. Then I saw there was a throne and the four living beings and the circle of the elders. This is the kingdom to come. This is when we're with Yeshua in heaven. And a lamb that appeared to have been slaughtered. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the sevenfold spirit of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll out of the hand of one of sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell in front of the lamb. And each one held a harp and a golden bowls filled with pieces of the incense which were the prayers and worship of God's people. Harp and bowl, harp and bowl. Imagine the imagery here. God gives us our, his heart. He speaks to us. How does he speak to us? Through his word and through worship. We worship and we praise him and receive direction. We cry out to God and we hear him and our prayers go up to heaven and they what? They fill the bowl. But what does God do? He takes it, he pours it out to us in blessing, in healing, in answering, in life, in mercy, and in restoration. And it's a continual cycle for all eternity. Why do you think all these 24-hour prayer groups around the world are so successful, like IHOP in Kansas City, that have been praying nonstop for 25 years? It's harp and bowl, harp and bowl. We praise and we worship the Lord. We lift up his name. We praise him. He pours out his anointing. He pours out his understanding. He pours out his power. Even the songs we sing are prophetically inspired. And what do we do? We pray it back to him. And it's a continual cycle of God's revelation in the earth. See, this is what sustained Nehemiah because he knew, and we see it in chapter 1. He didn't just cry out to God. He reminded God of his promises. Right. He reminded God of the truth. He praised and worshipped the Lord. It's not just, Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me, but Lord, you are glorious. You are magnificent. God is calling us into a season of harp and bowl. The living creatures, as I said, have the harps symbolizing continual praise. The living creatures also have the bowls holding the prayers of the saints, you and I. And the prayers go up, and guess what? The anointing comes down through the power of the prophetic and the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. See, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Esther, they, David, they all understood this reality. This was and is and exclusively is kingdom reality. In Nehemiah chapter 1, worship coupled with prayer, as I said, moves the heart of God. Yes. Not one or the other, but both. Do you want to move the heart of God? 
towards your life, towards this city, towards revival fire in Ocala, then your prayers must be coupled with praise. You must be people committed to praise. You must be a Beit Halal, a house of prayer and a house of praise. I believe that what makes this so powerful and so true is that if you study church history over the last two thousand years, and this is a fact, this is not my opinion, this is a fact. Every revival movement, every revival movement for the last 2,000 years was first marked by Harp and Wolf. Every one of them. Every one of them. What that tells us is that revival won't come if you don't do it. If we just come on the weekends and fill the pew, then that's all we're going to do. And the city will go to hell in a handbasket, and their blood will be upon our hands. But if we cry out to God and we live the reality of being worshipers, may we be worshipers, then we will see the power of God. This alone is God's blueprint for healing, restoration, revival, and redemption in this world. It is through this that the manifestation power of the kingdom of God comes. We can't win Israel without the power of God, and we certainly can't win our neighbor. That's right. But we must be a people of prayer. So as I conclude, from the book of Nehemiah, and as we shared earlier, our 12 pillars of Tikkun, God longs to equip us for last day's service, for a last day's calling to be what? Holy Messianic Revolutionaries. As I read earlier, to be a holy revolutionary is rebellion against Satan. Do we covenant to that? To rebel against Satan and his bonds and, and lies and deception. We rebel. We say no to those things. We say no to Hasatan and oppression in our lives. He will not have us any longer. And it were the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus alone, by the power of the Ruach, we wholeheartedly embrace completely and dramatically to the Lord for change and transformation in our lives. Not only for our restoration, but for the whole world. No compromise. No compromise. God, send your power. God, send your power. God, send your anointing upon us. We long for you. Like Maccabee, Lord, will we run to the battle? Lord, I pray that we would run to the battle. That we would run to be on our knees before you in prayer. That we would cry out to you. That we would spend our lives in prayer, in fasting, and crying out to you. Being a holy people, set apart, holy revolutionaries for a holy God. Say no to the things of the world. Some of you in here today, you might be struggling. You know, I have these struggles in my life. God wants to set you free today. He wants to make you his holy ambassador, his holy revolutionary. For the sake of the salvation of this city. Do we all agree that God loves Ocala? That God wants this city? That it's already his? He just wants to take it back? Even today, the lights of Ocala, people are there celebrating all kinds of different things. And Yeshua's not even there. Father, we just pray, God, that you would pour out your spirit upon us without measure. And set us apart for this great work. Lord, I pray that you would do in us the same work that you did in the prophet Nehemiah. That we would be people first of prayer and worship and then action, and that you fulfill your purposes in us. To all these things we pray, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Let's stand before the Lord. We sang early, return again. Return to the land of your soul. Let's return again and anew to our first love. Holy to the Lord. Holy to the Lord. Refer, return to worship and praise. Do you remember how
how you felt when you first gave your heart to Yeshua. How all those burdens just came off of you. The Lord wants to stir that up in you today. To renew your first love. Your first love for evangelism. To reaching out to people in the name of Yeshua. If that's grown stale, God wants to fan that flame today. Of outreach. Of love. Of service. And the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you today also may not have, have yet received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. With the evidence of speaking in tongues. God wants to give that to you today too. Because we can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want 90%? Do you want 60%? Or do you want 100%? Fall on the sword, we pray. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Return to the Lord. 